Letter 10 of Letters from Hell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters from Hell by Valdemar Adolf Disted. Translated by L. W. J. S. Letter 10 Amusement that is one of the common needs nowadays. The world requires to be amused, rich and poor alike. I do not say that, in itself, this is altogether blameworthy. It would be foolish to let the river of delight flow past and never stoop to drink. But to make amusement the one question paramount when life is so serious, when neighbors are in trouble and the poor in want, that surely is wrong, and yet that seems just what the world has come to. How shall we amuse ourselves, appears to be the great question nowadays, the solving of which, for thousands of men and women, seems to be the very object of living. They do not consider it necessary to be praying for daily bread, or return thanks when they have got it, but they never forget to cry out for amusement. And even the poor with whom daily bread is a question, whose young may be hungry and their aged be buried by the parish, must needs be amused. It was not so always. Fifty years ago the mass of the people were satisfied with doing their work and looking upon pleasure as a relaxation merely. But now amusement, with many, has come to be the thing to be worked and lived for, and acknowledging this to be a fact History holds up an appalling precedent. When ancient Rome made pleasure the aim of life, the nation was approaching its doom. How shall it be with the world? I do not know when its end may be, but I know this, that those of her children who run recklessly after pleasure are on the broad way that leads to hell, and the excess which is their sin on earth will be their punishment here. Is the world rich in places of amusement? Be sure so is hell. We too have our gardens, of Tivoli, call it Vauxhall, or Crystal Palace, or Champs-Élysées. It matters not, the thing is here. And whatever is being invented on pleasure-hunting earth, we have it to perfection. Does the world flock by thousands to its amusements? Hell does so by millions. All pleasures, all passions, run loose here in awful confusion, and helplessly you are whirled along. Yet no matter what excess there be of wanton gaiety, there broods over all that death-like stillness, hell's frightful atmosphere, which I have tried to describe before. Perhaps you remember the effect of sounds deadened by a muffling fog that may give you a faint idea of what I cannot otherwise bring home to you. If one succeeds at times in breaking away from this horrible pretense of pleasure, it leaves one panting and spirit-broken, sick of existence and longing for rest. But despite the loathing, one is immediately after it again, forcing the sentences to what never yields them a shadow of delight. Amusement here, let me tell you, is a very lash of correction, driving all thoughts of pleasure far, far away. Ah, how they long for work, those poor souls, to whom labor on earth was so hateful, or at best, but a means toward enjoyment. How gladly they would even slave on a galley here, deeming the meanest work a blessing. But the night has come when no man can work. There is a memory in this realm of death, of how the Son of God once descended to hell to preach to the spirits in prison, filling the space between the great deep and paradise with a cry of his infinite love and proclaiming liberty to the captives. Then hell for a time was light as day, but most of those present hardened their hearts and fell back into darkness. I felt a burning desire to meet someone who had heard the voice of the Son of God, but I own it was a foolish wish, since it could do me no good, all being vanity now and nothingness. Still in spite of that knowledge, here one is always trying and longing for something, 
There are naturally many souls in hell who heard that wondrous preaching, but they are all lost, and lost souls cannot help one to a ray of light. Had they but remembered a single word of the Saviour's, laid it up in their hearts, I mean, they would not now be here. Some certainly pretend to recollect this or that, but what they said in answer to my inquiry was cant and blasphemy in their mouths. It gave me no comfort, and despairingly I turned from my desire. I lately ventured upon an expedition through some outlying districts. Do not be surprised at my saying I ventured, for I assure you it needs courage here to get to know more than is absolutely thrust on your knowledge. Discovery is full of horror, even to him who has nothing to lose. Indeed, you must not ask me to describe to you all I saw and heard. It would take me too far, and it could not possibly interest you to hear all I might say concerning hell's inhabitants. Those crowds of thieves, murderers, deceivers, liars, misers, spendthrifts, perjurers, forgers, hypocrites, seducers, and slanderers. But stop. There are some I must tell you about. Look at that tribe of strutting turkeys in human guise. They are the self-conceited, a very refuse of hell. They thought well of themselves once, but are a laughing stock now. And these miserable women flapping their arms wildly and going about cluck-clucking like so many hens distressed for their brood, spreading wings of pity but vainly seeking for aught to be gathered in. They are the wicked mothers, groaning for the children they neglected in sloth or selfishness. And those queer creatures, fawning about so meanly, slobbering all whom they meet with sympathy, offering assistance right and left. They are the merciless ones. Their hearts were too hard formerly. They are too soft now. And no one here requires their mercy. A few other figures I may single out. I have told you of the great black river here, which is not the Lethe. I was sitting one day near its bank, thinking of the sad past and sadder future. The turbid waves rolled heavily by. Groans broke upon the silence about me. I started and I perceived a strange figure, strangely occupied. It was a man of commanding aspect, handsome even, but in most painful plight. He sat by the river washing his hands, which dripped with blood, but for all his washing, the dread crimson would not leave his fingers. As soon as he lifted them above the water, the red blood trickled down afresh. It was a pitiful sight. He seemed to be aware of my presence, for he turned upon me suddenly, saying, What is truth? I did not reply at once, feeling it to be a question that should not be answered lightly. But raising his voice, he repeated impatiently, What is truth? Well, I said, it is a truth and a sad one that it is too late now for us to be seeking the truth. This answer did not appear to satisfy him. He shook his head, turning away, and again he set to washing his hands. I endeavored to draw him into conversation. I seemed to suddenly know that he was one of those doubly miserable souls who had seen the Son of Man face to face and heard him speak, and I was most anxious to hear what he might have to tell me, but there was no turning him from his frightful occupation. I left him after a while. Who he was I knew without the testimony of his purple-bordered toga and the ring on his finger, Pontius Pilate. He shuns the city of the Jews and spends his time by the river washing his hands. But of every passerby, he asked the question, What is truth? Whatever answer he receives, he shakes his head. It is not general truths he wants to know about, but the truth, truth absolute, and that is not known here. And do you perceive the cutting contrast? Pilate inquiring about truth, yet washing his hands in the river of falsehood? I went my way through desert places, uncultivated tracks, that is, but nowise unpeopled. No spot in hell is uninhabited, however dismal and waste it may be. There are souls whom an inward necessity drives into the howling wilderness, 
those, for instance, who in life worked out dark plots ending in great crimes. These places are congenial to them. There is one terrible figure one meets at times in the dreariest wastes, a man tall and powerful, half-naked, the skin of some animal being all his clothing. The hair hangs wildly about his temples. There is a furtive look in his eye, and his brow is gloomy. There is a mark upon his forehead, and he carries a club. Not that he seems to require it, for he is a fugitive always, in constant fear of being slain. Everyone who meets him trembles, but he is afraid of the weakest and most helpless of creatures, fleeing them each and all for fear of his wretched life. Always alone he seems nowhere and everywhere. A cursed fugitive he was on earth, a cursed fugitive he is in hell. For the Lord has set his mark upon him, that everyone should know Cain and not slay him. I hurried away, anxious to get rid of the terrible sight. Here, then, I had found a soul that was more wretched than myself. But the thought was poor comfort. I could not shake off the impression of the lying flattery with which they buried me. But I forget, I have not told you my first experience by that vile river. As I neared it, I was met, would you believe it, by an account of my own obsequies. It was sickening, a miserable versifier. Lately come hither, it seems, was hawking about his latest production. I do not know that he really knew me, but he insisted on flourishing a paper in my face, and I could not help reading with my own eyes the flaring title to this effect. New and mournful ditty, in memory of Philip H. Esquire, whose heirs could pay for the grandest funeral and the most flattering parson to escort him to heaven, but could not keep him out of hell. Leading sentiment, his reverence's own, we shall meet again. A funeral ditty in honor of me, staring me in the face by the river of lies. I bit my lips, for I needs must read it. It began with a panegyric on my many virtues, very few of which I really possessed. It next broke out into a doleful lamentation about the lost society had sustained by my untimely death and end it with the description of the blessed life I had entered upon to receive the reward of my deeds, joy and glory unspeakable, which henceforth were my blessed inheritance. Terrible irony. I felt as though a hundred daggers had entered my soul. Sick at heart, I crumpled up the wretched production and fled from the place. It was some time before I could get over the deep bitterness of this experience. And when in a measure I had conquered it, that parson's leading sentiment remained as a drop of rankling poisoning. Thou fool, or hypocrite, which is it? As though a man had but to die to go straightway to bliss. I will not enlarge upon the hopeful statement you little dreamt of its possible meaning when you said we shall meet again. It was about this time that I first came across a king in this place. Pitiful sight. It is scarcely possible to conceive a greater contrast between the once and the now. Kingship on earth and kingship in hell. Of all the abjects one meets with here, I do believe emperors, kings, and princes of every description are the poorest. There are no empires and kingdoms here, save indeed Satan's, and nothing deserving the appellation of government. What rules us is a kind of social instinct and the habits of life we brought with us from the world. So you see, kings and princes are no eyes needed. Their rank, of course, entitles them to respect, and as on earth so here one bows involuntarily to their exalted position. But in truth they are too miserable to look for respect. It is with them as with the image of some castaway saint, the gilding of which has worn off, and which ends its days in the lumber room, ignominiously forgotten. Their former greatness was merely conventional. It was gilding, in fact, and no real gold. It has worn off, and there is nothing left to bespeak their majesty. The poor kings have no kingdom here to display their greatness, no armies that will fight and die at their bidding, no millions to be squandered. They have nothing left 
but the sad pretense of former grandeur. Their courtly state is represented by a few wretched sycophants, who stick to them, not for love, but for gain, elusive of course, and following former habit merely. I said they are miserable, weighed down would be a more descriptive word, and literally true, for they nearly sink beneath the burden of their crowns. Do you wish to know the possible weight of a crown? I will meet you with another question. Can you tell me how great a king's responsibility may be on earth? They weigh tons, these crowns, believe me. The poor kings, propped up as they are, by ministers and satellites, can scarcely more than crawl here, so heavy is their burden. Worse off than any of those potentates whose names on earth boasted of the addition the great. Alas, those great ones are peculiarly small here, and those five letters add an enormous weight to their crowns. Of truly great sovereigns, of course, none arrive here, and those others whom the world called great received that appellation merely because they were either great destroyers of human life, slaughtering the people by thousands for their own miserable renown, or perhaps because they outdid all other men and princes in that peculiar knavery, which goes by the name of statecraft. Some few also may have come by their distinction quite by chance. Perhaps they had clever ministers working for their glory. But these sometimes are the most conceited of all crown bearers. Nothing is left for them but to go to hell when they have done. What a gain it would have been for those poor potentates if, instead of striving for the appellation the great, they had been content to be called the good or the beloved. Charity, then, with them also, might have covered a multitude of sins. Now nothing is left but the wailing and gnashing of teeth. You never hear them speak. Sighing and groaning seems to be their one means of intercourse. But no one cares to listen. Indeed, they are scarcely fit for a society. The knowledge of this makes them shy and retiring. One hardly ever meets them. And if they do venture abroad... They are at once set upon as a hawk by innumerable sparrows, persecuted by all who suffered through them in life, as many half a nation sometimes. How inviolable might have been their days on earth, blessed beyond their fellows. All was theirs to make themselves and others happy, but ambition prevented them from seeing that their crown might, I should, be a well of blessing for the people. They were always speaking of their right divine, calling themselves kings by the grace of God. They forgot that it would have been far better to own themselves poor sinners through the grace of God than kings by right divine, and by that right be cast into hell. I spoke of destroyers of human life, but one need not be a king or emperor for that. Some of the most ruthless slaughterers of humanity the world has known were only generals, admirals, marshals, and the like. These also continue their career in hell, in vain endeavor. There are plenty here to flock to their standards, all those, namely, who on earth were forgetful of the peace and good will which the God of love proclaimed to mankind. They meet here, hundreds of thousands of them, and like so many grinning skeletons, at once prepare for battle, vain as show, their artillery produces mere smoke. The specter of phallics charges. One expects a great onslaught, but it is nothing. They merely change sides, as it were, and begin the battle afresh. They are unable to shed blood now, but they are forever spending their soul's energy in miserable bloodthirstiness. I thought of the warriors of Valhalla. Foolish comparison, for there is nothing in common between the heroes there and the would-be heroes here. The warriors of Walhalla are said to be resplendent with strength and glory, living not only a real, but a perfect life, whereas their wretched semblances here are only fit to move laughter and pity. You know that we are always suffering thirst, an agonizing burning thirst, ever longing for a drop of water to cool the tongue. No one, one would imagine, would willingly come to try and slack 
his thirst with the stagnant water of the horrible river. Nevertheless, there are some who do try it, quite secretly, though, as if that could be kept a secret, for their whole body swells and is puffed out with the slimy falsehood, which, breaking through their every pore, turns them into positive lepers of lying. Having drunk once, they always drink again, but their thirst is never quenched. As I am thinking of ending this letter, the shadow of a saying crosses my memory. That of good things there are always three. I forget which of earth's tongues has molded this into a proverb, but something more than a proverb often troubles me now. I remember that I used to be taught to believe in the trinity in unity, but I never get beyond the two now. I know something of a father and something of a savior, but was not there third to help one to say our father and my savior? Alas, the idea is a blank now, leaving a shadow to haunt me. There are other three I am vainly trying to recall to my heart. Faith, hope, and charity. I know nothing of faith now, and nothing of hope. I might have known charity, and I once believed I knew love. But now, alas, I know only what it might, what it should have been. Oh, that I could warn you who still walk in hope. Love is no light thing the deepest outcome of the soul. Had I known it truly, faith and hope now would stand by my side. Be warned, my brothers, my sisters. My heart yearns for you. It yearns for thee, my silent friend, who never with a word even hast answered any of these letters. For thee, mother, who never understood my deepest need. For thee, Martin, who in just retribution art as the lash now adding torment to torment. I love thee still. What is it thou would have told me? My heart is yearning, my brothers, my sisters, but vain, vain is the longing. It leaves me in hell. End of letter 10 Read by Rachel Costello